Monica, absolute pleasure, privilege to have you on the Sports Editor. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. We've got quite a few interesting questions to ask you, so really appreciate your time and glad to hear that you've recovered from COVID. So thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. No, it's a big honor. I always enjoy speaking to you guys. So uh, wherever I can help, it's a big honor. Thank you. The honor is mine. Lovely, man. And again, just doing some sort of research on you, and you're an educated man. You've done a number of degrees. But I was just trying to, I was thinking to myself that you've got a degree in, in human movement and geography. I'm trying to sort of try to tie the two together. How does it? <laughs> what is the thinking behind Yeah, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's strange. And again, I'm just going to give some feedback as well, or some background. I always wanted to go to my country. And uh, everybody gave me reasons why I can't do it. And that's, that's the pity of life, you know. If you, if you have a new idea, there's always five people that tell you, give you five reasons why you can't do it. So you, only, you don't need five reasons. You only need one reason why you can't do it. I'd rather work with people that give me reasons why I can do it. So to make a long story short, they always said, um, you know, I, I was a nobody. I'm still a nobody. And wherever I went in my life, I wrote it in my book as well. People said, um, it's, it's impossible. And I knew it's possible. And I wrote it down and there's certain steps I took. But to make a long story short, I always knew that you have to be either in those days in very big in the, in the general in the police or a professor at the university or in the, you know, in, in the army. And, 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 yeah. uh, yeah, or you had to play for the box or for the bulls. Right. I was nowhere. And I knew then whatever I have to study, I need to be ahead. When I get my chance, I need to be right. I always said to my players, you know, if a door opens, you have to be packed. Your bags have to be packed. So I knew if I'm going to get a chance, I'm going to be ready. So one of the things I did was to, to do teaching only for a year. I was, I, I was a teacher two and a half years, but I did one year of teaching. Okay. And you won't believe me. <clears throat> so uh, I did physical education just to help me with, for the fitness part. But in those days, uh, I wanted to do honors. I did my, my, my uh, teaching diploma, and then I wanted to study another year. In those days, we had to do army. So, <laughs> so, I, so I had to go to the army. So then I wanted to do honors, and I didn't want to do it in PT because as a teacher, you know, you're never going to be a, a headmaster if you're a PT teacher, probably a few around. So I thought geography, that was my other subject. And uh, I actually combined geography then with, 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 um, with PT because my honors I did about, um, you know, uh, uh, facilities, sport facilities around the country and uh, around Pretoria and I did research on sports facilities. So not totally the same, but there is, there is some, some uh, similarities. But the reason I, I wanted to do, a, a, I'm very, very, till this day, very sad I didn't do it. I wanted to do, a, a, I did a psychology degree just for background as well because I knew you have to work with players. Until this day, I'm sad I didn't do a honors in psychology, but those days I couldn't because it has to be a school subject. So to make a long story short, uh, geography was the only other subject, uh, which I did. And uh, yeah, so uh, I used a little bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah never getting ready, kicking all of that. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, excellent. But Annika, you know, you, you've got to take the good with the bad. And I think starting out your, your rugby career, coaching career, it was a bit tough at times, you know, getting going. But you just pushed through. You know, how did you do it? How did you manage to just say, you know what, I'm going to do this. doesn't matter what obstacles come my way. I'm going to push through and I'm going to end up coaching the Springboks. Yeah, I think the most important thing is, again, I don't want to try and sell my book here. I just, that's just I put all my principles in there. You have to have a vision. Everything starts with the vision. And the bigger the vision, the more the energy. You know, I speak with young players out there and they say to me, I ask them the first thing, what's your vision? And the first thing they tell me is to play for South Africa. And I said, that's not a great vision because you're going to be 21, 22 playing for South Africa. So I sat with guys like Victor and Derek and Farouk and all these guys. I said, Victor, you know, you can play 100 test matches. And I haven't thought about that. And I said, you know, you can play in three World Cups. You can play uh, against the British and Irish Lions. You can score, try and have a vision where you score against every country in the world. So that gives you enough energy to play rugby for 16 years, which Victor did. So... If your vision is big enough, it will pull you, you know. So I always wanted to coach South Africa. I, for me, it wasn't even a question, you know. I, I, I believe it, and that's my second point. You have to believe in your vision. So I believed it so much. So I was lucky as well, you know, because um, I was 32 and I was at the World Cup. And uh, this is not to be arrogant. I really mean this in a humble way. In 1995, I watched the World Cup, and uh, I was under 16 schoolboy coach. And Sunlam came around and said, you can pay money and then you can go to the 99 World Cup. But being a teacher, by the 27th, I didn't have money left. <laughs> so I said to my friend, which is also still a teacher, I said, I'm going to go to the 99 World Cup. I don't care how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go. 
obviously thinking more as a spectator. And uh, in the 1990 World Cup, four years later, I was 32 years, I was Nick Mallet's forward coach. So I say this not to be arrogant. I say, if I can do it, writing down your vision, believing it, have willpower, mm-hmm. you know, coming back from setbacks. And uh, so you are going to have setbacks. I was fired once or twice before that with the Bulls. Um, so if you have a big enough vision, I always believe that uh, you don't see this as a setback. It's a learning curve. You learn from that. Mm. And you must go through certain things to learn. So that was tough in the, in the beginning. Um, I also enjoyed it. One of my points is enjoyment. I enjoyed it so much that I didn't care. And I was so focused on the, on the, on the outcome. So uh, it just makes you stronger. And, um, you know, at awesome times. That's excellent. That's absolutely brilliant. Because uh, yeah, no, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. You, you've got to have a vision. It's so true. And the whole aspect which you said about being, yeah, I just want to be a springbuck, that's actually changed. That'll change a lot of people's thoughts, I think, because they think, you know, once I've represented my country, I've made it, but you're saying there's more to it. And that, that's actually, there's, that's it, brilliant. It, it, that's very, very important because the other thing is, you know, um, when I wrote my book as well, I, I set, set unrealistic goals. Because if you look at all the gurus out there, and I'm not taking them on, I'm, I'm just very simplistic and my principles are simplistic. You know, I always say set smart goals and the R is for realistic or relevant. But I mean, what is more unrealistic for a guy like Neil Armstrong that looked at the moon and said, I want to walk on the moon? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> totally unrealistic. So for me as well, to, to, to coach my country, I, I wasn't a great player. Um, you know, I was an, I'm still nowhere. So I really try to instill with the youth that anything is possible. If you can mm-hmm. get your mind around it, I mean, Walt Disney came and said he wants he want to build a, a Disneyland and stuff. Everybody laughed at him, you know, and he said, if you can imagine it, you know, it, it can be true. So I'm very big on, on having a bigger vision because it's like a magnifying glass. This is very important. You know, if I take a magnifying glass and, uh, you know, I just put it on different places, there's no energy. Mm. If I've got a very vision and I'm, I've written it down because I, 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 you, must, you must write it down. So now I'm focused. So all the energy goes through that magnifying glass. I'm totally focused. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have setbacks, but I know where I'm going. Then that, that can start a fire that can destroy countries. And so I'm, for me, it's very, very much about focus and having a big vision. And like I said, not just to play for your country. That's a given. You mm. have to break it up in little things that can keep you going for 10, 20 years. And that's the same for business, I suppose. Absolutely. And I'm like, we, we're going to get into your book a bit, a bit later, but there's one or two more questions I'll ask you before that. But, but talking about dreams, and like you said, you, you did coach, obviously, South Africa at 32 years of age. I still feel, though, it is, it is a good goal, though, to want to coach South Africa. I mean, that, that's sort of the highest levels of coaching one could get to. So in that aspect, it's still good though, to try and achieve that level, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. Because, again, you know, if, uh, the bigger the dream, like I said, the bigger the energy. Mm. And most of people are so sad that they undersell themselves. Mm. At least if you have a big dream, you don't get there, you, you still achieve something. And again, yeah. like I've said now, people say be realistic, but I don't believe in that because, I mean, if you look at what guys achieved that, that nobody gave a chance, and it's normal people. You know, I've done a lot of research on s- successful people, and they're all just normal people with a big dream. So sure. um, if you want to do something, um, you know, you have, to, you have to dream big. And, and I usually say the guys that dream with their eyes open, you know, that's, that's the guys that makes a difference because most guys dream with their eyes closed and um, that's not what you want. You want to dream big. And, and it's such a pity. There's so many great, great people of talent out there. And, and I've coached a lot of players of talent that didn't make it because they didn't have the vision of making it. And that's, that's so sad. It's all, in, it's, all in the, it's all in the mind. Sure. So it's, it's like a combination of you've got to have talent, but you've also got to have the understanding of I've got to have like a plan in place almost. I need to... You have to have a game plan. Definitely. Otherwise, exactly. Otherwise, it's like the magnifying glass. Mm. You know, you do this, it doesn't work. Now doing this, it doesn't work. That's why we lost with the Bulls. And I say we, it was a a team effort. But we we knew we were on the right track because we we wrote everything down. We had the the game plan. Mm. And um, obviously, work ethic and things like that comes into play. But um, for me, you start with with a vision. And that's, for me, probably the most important. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But I just want to touch on one thing with your, your coaching career at South Africa. You, you won back-to-back end of year tours. I don't think anyone's ever actually done that before, um, which is absolutely brilliant. But it, does, it just goes to show how much depth and strength is in South African rugby generally, in, also with the players. There seems to be a good group of players you can, you can choose from and build. Is it still in that? Yeah. It's a great question and you're very good to me 
Um, <laughs> like I said in the book as well, I, I mostly talk about the pan loss because you, I've learned from that. But we were fortunate. We had very, very good times as well. We were probably the only team ever that's won back-to-back, like you said, end of year mm-hmm. tours. And I think, again, what's important, what I've learned from that, and that's where we made a mistake against Japan, is we have to play to our strengths. And mm-hmm. I had a lot of conversations with Russia, and that's why I was so, so happy in the World Cup. And I've been under pressure for years to try and play a different brand of rugby with the Bulls or South Africa. And whenever we move away from that, we're not successful. So you're 100% right that um, you, know, you have to stick to what you're good at. And we, are, we have very, very good players. We've got big players that like to hurt people. I mean, mm. that's just the nature of the beast in South Africa. Yeah. It's just, so yeah. when we play to our strengths, we've got so much talent. Uh, we've got unbelievable t- talent. And, and uh, you should just look at our schoolboy talent. And just worldwide, you know, I've coached all over the world. I've just came back from France. And there's no one in a country, and I've been all over, that's got the same talent as, that we have. Mm. So uh, if you just nurture that talent and, and get that going and, and install discipline of them and the work ethic and things like that, I mean, we should be world champions for years to come. I'm going to touch on that schoolboy question a bit later, if that's all right. But yep. we're going to jump to your, your, your book, Nahanika. And it, it seems really, really good because your, your heading is seven, my notes on, on leadership and life. So from that title, I would assume that you're just talking about the experiences that you had in your own personal life and obviously in the rugby life that you've encountered? Yes, you know, um, when we were successful with the Bulls, and I say we, and especially it's the Springboks as well, everybody asked me to write an autobiography, but uh, for me, there's no sense in that because if, you, if you're truly honest, which I try to, to live my life by, uh, you have to stumble on toes and you have to tell the truth. And if I, if I write a book about what happened in my coaching career, um, you know, it's, it will be really, really bad for a lot of people out there, but you don't make a difference. I've always coached to make a difference. And one of the things I, I say in my book, I decided to write the book to give people hope because it was, mm. before, it was the first wave of COVID and a lot of people lost businesses, a lot of people struggled. And one of the main themes of my book is Muhammad Ali fought against Sonny Liston. And Sonny Liston was an animal. He was, he was in jail. Nobody gave Ali a chance. And in, this, in, in the sixth round, Ali wanted to stop fighting because Sonny Liston then put winter green or like, you know, deep it on the laps and hits Ali in the face the whole time in the eyes. So Ali was actually wanted to stop. And uh, Castro Marta, his coach, pushed him in and said, listen, go one more round. Go out there and fight one more round. Don't stop. Don't care about the world. Just go out there and fight. And then actually had a very, sorry, Ali had a very good sixth round. It was the fifth round that he wanted to stop. And then the seventh round, Sonny Liston three in the tail. Nobody could believe it because he was this unbelievable fighter Total, total favorite, and he threw in the towel. So to make a long story short, the, 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 the theme of my book is to go out and fight one more round. Mm. And I wanted to give people out to hope in this, this time, especially with businesses. And, and little did I know that uh, I'm going to get COVID. And uh, in my mind was, again, you know, go out and fight one more round. And um, it's a tough time for, for everyone. But I really wanted to, in, to, to inspire with my book and uh, especially young people, not just leaders, and uh, I've had unbelievable feedback. The book is a top 10 seller. You don't make money out of a book. I must say that as well. <laughs> it's more leaving a legacy for my kids. But it's a top 10 bestseller and it's the number one sports book. And I had so much. I said, obviously, you're not going to make money. If I just get one person say that it made a difference in his life, it would be worthwhile because mm-hmm. that's why I coach. And, I, and I, you know, I can't tell you how many people have texted me and SMS me and said, listen, it's been unbelievable, very inspiring and, and, and got their life back on track. And for me, that's why I always coach to make it difference it's, it's it's been amazing so it's been an amazing journey and again i want to say to the people out there you know it's tough times now but we we south africans you know we mm, we're strong we're tough. we have to yeah. go out there and fight one more round we stick together yeah. you know we can we can beat anything in the world and um, so hopefully i can inspire a few people and that's why i wrote a, auto, not an autobiography but uh, just leadership lessons and i actually didn't want to because you have to be very honest and you have to be very open and uh, I actually want to be out of the limelight. I don't, I'm probably one of the only coaches that don't like the limelight. So it puts you right back into the limelight. But like I said, I've got great reviews and I'm really happy I did it today. No, absolutely, absolutely. So it's almost like sort of like a, what you call like a self-help book. Self-help book. The ideas are there, the options are there, and you're encouraging people, look, grab it. Here's a solution to a tough time. You've got to take it with both hands. Yes, and you know, it's simplistic things. I wanted to write a short book. You can read it in a day and a half. Very punchy of a lot of stories, a lot of motivational stories and things I've, and my highs and my lows. But again, I wanted to, um, you know, to really go out there and, and, and simple principles that we all know, but we don't do. Mm. For example, I start, I start a book and say, 
uh, believe it or not, every morning when you wake up, you have a decision to be positive or negative. That's a decision. Mm -hmm. And the strange thing is it takes exactly the same amount of energy. Sure. So even when I was sick, when I wake up every morning, I decided I think you can either be negative today or you can be positive. And so that helped me as well. So that was just a general thing in life. And with all the media and all the, you know, all the social media and all the, there's so much negativity. Mm. And if I can get people one advice, they cut it out of your life. Yes. Because the mind starts mm. to read this negativity and then, you know, you start to feel negative. So yeah. it's simple principles, but you have to actually have a decision on your attitude. And you know what was strange? I haven't said this to, to anyone. Um, and I mean this with a lot of respect. You know, it's a lot of respect and empathy. Don't, don't get me wrong. But when I was sick, and it's the first time I talk about it, I, I didn't put it out in the media. You know, people phone you and say to you, listen, um, how are you feeling? And I say, oh, I'm feeling bad. And they say, listen, have you, have you heard this guy's died? Oh. Have you heard this guy's died? Yeah. So then what I've learned from this, and if I'm, I'm just saying it maybe to give people out there, I say, don't phone me. Give me the, give me the names of 90% people that make it. Don't give me the names mm. of people that didn't make it. And I know it's, I say there's a lot of sentiment and I know there's a lot of, lot of uh, um, you know, sad people out there, but you have to be positive and, and people that phone you need to be positive. You know, it's, it's so pity that people phone you and, you know, they ask you, are you, are you on the next thing they tell you about people that's dying around you? So uh, it's just a really, really big mental thing for me. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from that where mm. the positivity, I'm not saying if you're just positive, you're going to live. I've got a lot of respect. There's a lot of people struggling there, but at least you have to have positive people around you, not just in COVID, in life. Yeah. Because if you want to know where you are, go look at the people you spend a lot of time with. And, and my biggest thing with coaching was when my management team start to be negative and they tell me what they read in the media, I said, I don't want to know that because I'm in a good vibe. I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm trying to pick up the team. Don't tell me about the negative stuff or the negative social media because that pulls me off. Mm. So it's simple principles that, that we know, but we don't do. No, that's so true. That's so true. And I agree with you. It's amazing how we can just slip towards that negativity. It's absolutely, That's unbelievable. absolutely Especially in this country. Especially in this country. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but it, it's interesting, though, because I really like what you're saying. And I'd like to talk about energy. It's, it's really, really good. I can, I can see you're passionate about it. It's, it's a no-brainer. It's brilliant. Um, <laughs> but it, it, you, you're right. Sometimes... Difficult situations come along, but it doesn't mean you need to be negative. And that's this, if I'm understanding you right here. And I think a lot of people will jump on that difficult situation and see, ah, you see now, I can't handle this. Look what lasts on me. But like you said, it's, you need to learn something from here. Like you spoke about Japan. It was tough, man. That was a difficult situation. Yeah. But through it. Is that also sort of yeah. the of the book there as well? That difficult yeah, situation. Yeah, one of my things I will yeah, that's my point five. You have to be mentally tough. And every single mm. person in life that's successful has had setbacks. And I wrote in my book in, in 2002, my wife had cancer. My father had five double heart pass. And that same night, they wanted to fire me. And then suddenly you think a lot of things go through your mind. And we came back and won a carry cup. They wanted to fire me. I wouldn't, couldn't pay for my bills, my wife, so many things. And because we were positive, and we've really worked hard, work ethic. Uh, we won the carry cap and I got an extension on my contract. So what I usually say is, is like, a, you know, it's like I like stories, but it's like a, it's like a, a butterfly. You know, a butterfly is in a, in a cocoon. And if it starts to crawl out and you help it, you know, you help it with a tweezer to try and make it easy, they die. Mm -hmm. They have to struggle to get through that co 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 cocoon, if that's the right English word, because that, that's, that strengthens their wings. Then you can have a beautiful butterfly. And the best, I always go through the, through, the, through, the, through the warmest fire. So most of the players that makes it, that big, big setback sooner or later, and you have to come back from that because that makes you strong and that prepares you for life. So I haven't seen wow. any guy that's been successful that just take the easy route. And what I always say when I pick players, I say I'm not the best coach, but I was a very good judge of character. And it's like charcoal, you know. Charcoal doesn't mean anything. You can buy it next to nothing. You buy with that every Saturday. But if you take charcoal... And you put it under pressure for, for a million years, or I don't know how many years, but still 100,000 years, you get diamonds. True. So I always say I like players that can win World Cups because as soon as the pressure's on, they embrace the pressure, they love the pressure, and then they get better for it. So mm -hmm. you are going to get setbacks. And um, I know there's a lot of people struggling with businesses and, 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 and closing, but sometimes you start to fresh and you, and, and you just get better in it. So uh, I always say go there and fight one more round. And like I said, we, uh, you learn from that, mostly. You learn from that. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, there's some gems there. Absolute gems, Annika. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's really, really good. Sure. 
because then it got me thinking as well, you know, there's almost a fine balance because I believe in hard work. I believe you must work hard. And, but there's some people saying now you've got to work smart. So I'm sort of saying, well, what's your opinion here? How do you sort of mix the two? Or can you not mix the two? What do you think? You, must you just work hard or just work smart? I think my, I think my point four uh, is, is uh, work ethic. And I always say to my team, you only have to work half a day to be successful. You can decide if it's the first 12 hours or the second 12 hours. <laughs> um, that's what we did with the Bulls. And, and I said, the Bulls team was fitter than any other team. The box, you never have time. But by saying that, as I get older, I also think you need to be balanced. Hmm. Because you're actually juggling, you're juggling glass, uh, glass, like glass bowls, and you're juggling this. And, and sooner or later, if you just work, 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 one is going to fall on the ground. Maybe that's your, that's your, 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 your family life or your, or, your, you know, or your married life. And you never get that ball back because it's loss. So when I was a youngster, obviously you have to pay a price. I was never at home. I saw one of my kids only for 30 days. You have to, you have to work hard. But I think nowadays I'm more tempted to have a balance. And smart is, I've seen guys and young coaches, they sit in front of their computer the whole day. And I say to them, go home. You know, if you, if, if you haven't finished a job in by five, six hours, you're not going to see anything else. But they feel that they're sitting there. I had a lot of fights with young coaches lately about this. <laughs> they feel the players see them sitting there the whole time and, they, and, and people think they've got a work ethic. That's not a work ethic for me. You know, if, if sure. you can do the same job in five hours, why must you sit there for 10 hours? And you, you, so sometimes we feel we must be busy. I don't believe in that. I believe in the hard work and the whole team working towards the common goal. But obviously, you have to work hard if you want to achieve something. But what I try to, what I try to say to people, my point six is enjoyment. So when I, was, when I worked like 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day at one stage at the Bulls, it wasn't work. I enjoyed it so much for me. It was right. just passion. And right. I didn't see it. And so I think if, if, I think if it's work, then it's difficult to be successful. It must be a passion where you can put in the hours and you look at your watch and suddenly you see it's, it's six, six hours later. So I, one of my, my point six is you have to enjoy what you do. And if you don't enjoy, get something else because you'll mm. never be successful. So it's a fine line. So if the vision is right, and you really enjoy what you do, I think there will be some sort of balance. But, um, you know, just for work for work's sake, um, there's no success in that. Yo, that's, a, that's a brilliant perspective. I think you've just opened something there that, that's really good. Yeah, you, you've got to have the vision. That's true. You've got to have the vision. Yeah, the passion, sorry. It's, yeah, no, Hanukkah, you hit the nail on the head there. Absolutely fantastic. Really, really good. Um, when you look at certain people, they will do things for hours. I mean, it's like TV games. I always laughed, you know, this is, this is actually a joke on, on my behalf. When my kids were small, they were playing TV games. They could play the whole day. And I said, listen, TV games are never, ever going to bring you anywhere in life. You have to enjoy that, but you have to work. Now they show me all these millionaires of guys playing TV games that's earning millions. I said, but how can that be possible? I said, that people are just watching this guy. I said, it's impossible. But it just shows you that nothing is impossible. If a guy likes TV games and he can make a living out of that and he can get rich out of it because for him it's not work. <laughs> I always say to them, it's a waste of time. But there's some guys now, especially in America, making huge money out of, out of playing TV games. Yeah. So there's no right and wrong. So some things you can do because you love it, and that's not work. But if it starts to be work, I think you're in, a, you're in the wrong industry. Then you need to change where it's not work. Mm. Uh, you, know, you have to enjoy what you do. That's so important. You know? I really enjoyed what I did. I loved coaching. And, I, and, and for me, it wasn't work. I would have done it for free, and I did do it for free. Um, I did it when I was in the amateur eras. I was a teacher. I coached three teams, university team oh. and a schoolboy team. And it was just because I enjoyed it so much. So uh, you have to enjoy what you do, I believe. Excellent. Absolutely brilliant. So do you, you believe, you know, your book with the, the seven my notes and leadership and, and life, that'll help someone cultivate excellence, I'd say, really getting the most out of their life, really just flourishing. Is that a good yeah. sort of summary? I think so, but that's a very, very, that's a very, that's a very, very interesting question because success and excellence is how you define it. Yeah. For me, there, yeah, is, there is people that is, there's people that's multimillionaires and I read a very great quote the other day and say, they're so poor, the only thing they've got is money. <laughs> Just think about it. The only thing they've got is money. And I know people like that because yeah. if the children hate them, nobody likes them. I know people like this. I've met them. They must pay people to, to sit with them around the table at night because they've got no one. They've got just this money. So I think that's, for me, that's not success. Um, you know, success is, 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 uh, 
So there's a lot of guys, you talk about excellence. For me, like a, a very good mother that's got three young kids which you educate and help, and, and, and for me, that's success. So it, it yeah. depends how you, are you, uh, you know, are you, are you, your definition of success, but what, what it can do, it can inspire people and help people to find their passion and, and, and you know, just simple principles that can make your life better. And that's why I said it was, it was marketed as a leadership group. Um, but again, you know, I said it's not leaders because leaders are totally overrated. Every single guy at home, every, you, you, you in the teaching business, that's our best leaders. And the youth is our leaders. So uh, mm -hmm. my seventh point is uh, you can't do it alone. You have to do it with, with people. Um, and um, everything I've done in my life, I said, you can't do it alone. The Lone Ranger was it alone. Tarzan was it alone. And, and the guy like Edmund Hillary was the third guy to climb Mount Everest. But Tenzin Norway was his Sherpa, and he was with him. He didn't get a credit, but he was with him the whole time, actually helping him. So my, my big thing is they asked a guy called Andrew Carnegie. He was a millionaire in the 50s, and not in the Rand, in, 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 in the U.S., and they asked him, what's the secret of his success? And that's why I coached. And he said, you know what? People are like the mining industry. You take layers and layers and layers of rubble off, and soon somewhere you'll find a gold nugget. Mm. And if you can nurture that, you'll be successful. And he had 50 millionaires working for you. So the book is for me just about helping people to, 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 to do it, you know, just to, to, to reach their potential. And I'm very humble in the book. And I say, you know, there's an I've lost against Japan. I take full responsibility, but I've learned from that. Mm. And the book is all about saying, listen, I'm a very, very normal human being. Wherever I went at school, when I went to university, when I left uh, Woolworths, wherever I went, people said to me, you'll never coach at Africa. And the principles for me is not to say how great I am. I'm actually saying, listen, I'm just a normal person with not a lot of skill, not a lot of talent. If I can do it, you can do it as well. Mm. Just live your dream mm -hmm. and live life to the fullest and, and, uh, and, and, enjoy what you do so it's very simple principles so i really hope that i can inspire people out there no i reckon definitely Annika. that definitely you've inspired me that's I, i'm i'm loving this it's brilliant <laughs> it's really, no, really awesome. <laughs> thank you well, Annika, can we turn our attention to to local rugby just briefly yeah sure um curry cup it's it's final time just generally are you happy how do you think S surprised not surprised how well the bulls have done sharks have done quite nicely it's, it seems to be yeah, a good, first of, yeah. yeah, first of all, I'm a very positive person. So this is, this is against my character. I don't think that, I don't think that the, the, um, you know, I don't think the quality was that good. But by saying that, you must understand, I don't think uh, I've spoken to a few of the coaches and I don't think the public realize how difficult it is to prepare. Yeah. Because they yeah. prepare for two weeks, then five guys got COVID, then they had to take them out for 10 days and, and then they bring them back and then they can't train with the team. So in, if you look at the bigger picture, um, obviously, the quality won't be that great, but it was still good quality. And what was great for me is that um, a lot of young players came through because we've got so many mm. players overseas. There's a big, big opportunity for youngsters to come through. And I think one of the reasons the Bulls are successful, I think Jake's done a great job, is they played to his South African strengths, but they've got Dwayne, which I was the, you know, uh, he, he was, you know, one of my, of my leaders. But he's got yeah. such a great knowledge about the game. And then they got Mornay, which is, he played for me. I write it in my book, you know, maybe just to go back. I coached Mornay since he was 18. And I coach him, the Bulls, I coach him at South Africa, I coach him at Stade Francais, till up till now. And Mornay hasn't probably missed five sessions in those, all those years I've coached him. And I also write about his work ethic, which I said, when I coached Mornay, he didn't even kick for his school. He didn't, it wasn't in grey, he was in San Dupassi. And just by training and training and training, I've got videos where we played against Georgia, a friendly, and he missed eight kicks in front of the poles. And just by coaching and just by work ethic, when he's the best kicker probably in the world. But to get back is, uh, you know, a lot of youngsters came through, which is great. But I think the reason the Bulls, one of the big things is they play South African type of rugby and with Dwayne there and, and Mornay there in, in experience, a lot of other teams lack that. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm not surprised. I, I really think they've done well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I, I, you know, I got a bit, when we're going to bring the schoolboy thing in, I got a, I got a bit grumpy. When I thought guys were saying, yeah, the Curry Cup is not what it used to be. And I thought, well, you know, a lot of the players are overseas, prior to that. And the point that you brought up as well, it's like, man, these guys are training under difficult situations. No, it's very difficult because and they don't get momentum, you know. It's like, it's like when you start the preseason or the first three rounds of Super Rugby, it's never been good. Yeah. Then the more you play. 
So these guys mean start, stop, start, stop. And it's, you know, it's very, very difficult for a hooker to throw. It's so small little thing. So if you look at the context of it, I thought, I thought it, was, it was great. And I thought it was good pressure situations where the youngsters will learn from. And there's a lot of youngsters that came through, which I was very impressed. Mm. So if you look at all the you know, attributes and all the factors, you know, I think it was a good character. And the circumstances, because it's very difficult. Yeah. You're talking about difficult circumstances. There's obviously been no schoolboy rugby season. Do you think that it's going to have a negative impact? Or will the guys just sort of keep their training going somehow? And hopefully next year... Uh, I'll tell you what... Is. I'm a very big on schoolboy rugby. I love schoolboy rugby. I've, I've, mm. I've, I've, I've done a, a, a tournament as well with New Zealand schools and South African schools. I like schoolboy rugby. I really feel for the schoolboys because uh, my, I've got three boys and they were in office. And then last year was the 100 year, just to take my little scenario, they were, it was the 100 years of office. They had a brilliant team. And a lot of those youngsters, especially in, in a lot of the rugby schools, their whole life they prepared just to play for their, for their, for their first team. Obviously, other kids as well, as much as the first team. And suddenly, they don't play. Mm. Uh, so, it's been really tough on the guys. And then yeah. now, a lot of guys are lucky to have a second chance because they're a year younger. But it gets to them mentally because a lot of these guys want to be professional players. Now, in South Africa, there's less franchises. Yeah. There used to be six, six franchises. Now, it's only four. So, these kids, I speak to them and I mentor a lot of young kids. I speak to them daily. Where they say they're not sure they're going to play. And uh, mentally, it gets to them. They're not sure they're going to get contracts. Yes. So in the biggest scheme of things, I think there's a lot of youngsters that's not going to get the opportunity, which is very sad. But I want to say to them as well, you know, fight one more round. Yes. If you're good enough, you'll get through. You know, guys like Dwayne didn't even play on the 20 rugby. He was at the Pumas. Willie Leroux was at Dwellant. He didn't play. Louis de Jager was at Leopards. He didn't play. So, oh. you know, don't give up. Yeah. I, can, I can mention most of the players that came from small unions that didn't get chance and then start playing and then becoming super spring box. So there's Puff was at Pumas. Um, Faf de Klerk, he, he played there for a long time at the Pumas and then got a chance, Vincent Koch. So I can mention a lot. But to get back to schoolboy rugby, uh, you know, it's such a big part of our heritage and our culture. It's very sad that there's the, the, all these derbies and all these games didn't take place and now even more so. So mm. I feel for the youngsters. I really feel, I think it's, it's not good for our country, but that's, that's worldwide. And the youngsters must just be, like I said, at charcoal. They must be strong enough to come back and shine like diamonds. If you're good enough, they can't keep you back. But in, in general, I really feel for the guys because they really want to present their schools. They're proud. It's a proud you know, to play for your school. And a lot of guys are not going to get that opportunity, which is very sad. That's true. That's true. Yeah, but you've got to keep at it somehow. Like you said, you've got to make a plan and we'll keep going. But I think well, one... I've, I've just said, sorry that I interrupt you. I just no, no. said that the setbacks make you stronger. You're either going to swim or, 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 or sink. And the guys that get stronger from that, that, that really worked and improved their bodies and get through injuries, they will make it. Mm. Again, it's a mind thing. So mm. it's the same for everyone. The guys that's positive and get out of this and, and, and use that as a positive and take this, this negativity and setbacks and use that, you know, when they get a chance, they will enjoy it more. They will be more thankful for it and not take it for granted. That's the guys that's going to make it. So they need to be mentally tough and get through it. But before the best schoolboy rugby in the world, I'm, I'm totally, totally uh, sure about that. Yes. And it's part of the reason we're successful in South Africa. We've got by mm. far the best professional system in schoolboys. And I'm proud about it for all our teachers out there because the other, other countries don't have it. They're very, very, you know, they're very uh, um, jealous of us. Yes. I've just came back from France. They have no schoolboy rugby. They, yeah. they, they, play, they start in clubs and they, that's why they develop late. So we've got a brilliant system and we must be thankful for that and embrace that. Yeah, we've got to keep it going. Very, very important. We've got to keep it going. But talking about a big event that, I don't know, seems to be on and off and on is the British and Irish Lions Tour. Um, you think South Africa is going to do well? Let's, let's say it's going ahead. Let's hope it's going ahead. Do you think we're going to do well? well first, of all, like, first of all, like I said, I'm positive. It's going to be, it's going to be very touch and go. I, I, I definitely hope it goes. You know, we need it. South Africa need it financially and just mm. on a roll. Um, I think we've got... Two of the best facts in the world. That's why we won the World Cup. You win World Cups with, with, with forward rugby and with, with big forwards and strong forwards and scrummaging um, and, and driving lineouts. That's where most of tries come from. So we've got unbelievable packs. The, the thing is going to be, which is, I struggled in my World Cup and Rossi got right, is that you don't have time with these guys because most of these guys now, if you look at our team, is based in, in the UK yeah. you know, or in France. So the difficulty of a Springbok coach is you only have a week before a test match. So we went well prepared against 
Japan was my fault. I didn't fight enough for camps. I didn't ask for enough uh, uh, chances to prepare the team. And, and I paid the price and we came back and almost won it against, I think, the best all-black team ever. So to come back, I definitely think we've got a players. I think we've got better players than, than the Europeans at this stage. Mm. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't win it. But the problem is your preparation. And um, a lot of these teams will be together, especially in, uh, the English players and, and, and probably the Irish players. A lot of them will be together and can, can uh, have camps and stuff. My only worry is a lot of our players now, if you look at them, are all in, based in France and in England. And those clubs, you know, they only have to release them a week or two before a test match. It's, it's a rule IRB 9. So if we get enough time to prepare, um, you know, we've got an unbelievable team. A lot of these guys learn from, from the overseas conditions. They play against these other yes. guys from England. And so we've got a very strong team. A lot of those guys, are, you, want to, you want a player like 50 test matches, 27 years old. That's what you, that's what you aim for. And if you look at all our, all our strengths, all those guys are now 50, 60 test matches, won a World Cup, and they're 27, 28 years old. Mm. Um, it's probably only Dwayne that's a little bit older. So yeah. A lot of our guys are still young and they can, they can win another World Cup. So I think we're in an unbelievable position that you have this young, two packs, all young, and they can go to the next World Cup. So I'm very positive that we can beat any team in the world. Yeah, absolutely. You, you were talking about the, the forwards there, and I think we've got a great pack. But there's been talk that, that England lock, Mauro Mar Itoje, if I pronounce correctly, yeah. is probably the best lock in the world. I don't know if I can agree with that because I think even Etzebeth is just in a league of his own. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, I feel as so well, freaking I think as... So he's a great player. I think the thing is an athlete and he can play, he can play a, a flank as well. He's a great player. But uh, I've, I've picked Eben for South Africa when he was 20. Uh, he's a warrior. You know, you absolutely. don't get those guys it's like Dwayne. He's an absolute warrior and, and he's an athlete as well. Yeah. So if you look lock per se... There's not a lot, a lot of locks that can, that can compare with Eben. I mean, he's just in a different class. Uh, Peter Steve is also brilliant. I remember I picked him out of position at flank and the whole world was against me. Now I see that only playing flank and he was the best <laughs> flank in the world. So I have to get that one in. But again, he's also, and we've got brilliant locks. You know, Luet is also, you know, unbelievable. Uh, we've got really, really good locks. But Eben is special, you know. He's, a, mm. he's an animal and... Uh, um, uh, you know, he's a uh, is coming through. You know, I, 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 mean, I recruited him. I, it's, yeah. It sounds I, 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 but I recruited him for the Bulls when he was 15. He was in office where my sons were. So I saw him as an under 15 boy running the, he was two meters under 15 running the, 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 uh, the, 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 the off Sorry, I don't know what the English word, uh, the relay. Relay. Okay. I mean, he, and I remember when I walked, one day I walked with Eben and said, you seen that youngster? He was 19, coach, play, uh, we, we trained at the Bulls. And I walk with him and I say, you see that guy, you're going to play 50 tests with him. He said, who's that? I say, you'll, you'll tell me one day and it's happened. So we've got brilliant locks. I think we've got the best locks by far in the world. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, mm -hmm. but our locks are usually very, very mobile, very physical, which you want. And uh, they're athletes. So it, it is a great player, but I mean, Eben and all these other guys I mentioned are warriors. And, uh, Absolutely. I'll always Absolutely. go to all of them. I'll go to all of those guys, especially Eben. We're very close. And in France as well, he's, he's just played flank now in France. It just shows you the, the versatility, but he's a, he's a warrior, that guy. He's an unbelievable athlete and a warrior. No, oh, that's so good to hear. That's so good to hear. <laughs> I know, we, again, we were talking about gameplay a bit earlier and how important the scrum is, but do you feel that's where South Africa's strength lies in the squad at the moment? Just how solid and strong that pack is. That's where the, the true strength of South African rugby is at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, we always joke and say that... Uh, um, the forwards carry the piano and the backs play it. So, uh, <laughs> but if somebody, if somebody doesn't carry the piano, there's no backs to play. So if you look at rugby, that's why we won the World Cup as well in the scrums. You know, we've got two unbelievable backs. And if you look now, most, and it's fortunate for South Africa, but sometimes unfortunate in world rugby. Most tries comes now from driving malls. Mm. And uh, because we've got an unbelievable big back, you know, you've got a driving mall, you get a penalty, you kick in the corner, you either get three points or you drive again. And then, now, every second scrum is a 50-50 penalty. And we, so we're very strong driving malls and, and, and scrums. And rugby always changes. You know, it goes in circles. Now, most of the laws are, are for the dominant team of driving malls and scrums. Um, later, it changes again. But at this stage, you know, it's very difficult to stop a driving mall. I watch the bulls yeah, as well. Yeah. We look at all the tries. Just yeah. the, the, the try from the, it wasn't allowed, but the try from the, from the shark is a driving mall. You can't stop it because uh, if you stop it illegally, it's a yellow card or another penalty. And it's very, very difficult to stop it. So I believe we've got a very, very good pack. 
but we also got some good back, young backs coming through. You know, you have to have the backs, and, and you've got some great backs, but at the end, it's all about the hunting pressure, and that, that starts at the back. So, uh, South Africa, when we won World Cups, we had great backs and, and, and good defending backs that can, that can score tries. So, I think you've got a good balance there. But uh, it's all about experience, and like I said, we, I'm very, very happy with South Africa. We've got a lot of guys, 27 years old, won a World Cup, and they've got 50 mm. tests plus. And that, that, that experience, which Dwayne and, and, and the Mornay show for the Bulls, you can't buy that because when the pressure is up, that's where you make mistakes, you know, and that's where you give away penalties. So you can see we've got an unbelievable team that can win the next World Cup, like I said. Mm, mm, mm. One Thank question you, is just popping to my head. Sorry, if you've got time. Sorry. The cheaters. No, no, yeah, sure. The cheaters, they're trying to find a loophole to yeah, get I, to a European competition somehow. Yeah, you know, it's, I understand all the reasoning. Okay. But I'm a, I'm a fair person. I believe in fairness. I feel for the cheetahs. You know, they, they yes. kicked them out of Super Rugby where they were ahead of some teams. They go in the Pro 14. They get a sponsor for three years. Everything is great for the cheetahs. They play in that. And in, in a, in a, in a, it's a minor competition. And now they've been kicked off there as well. So this for me is a sensitive point. I know there's a lot of ifs, ifs and buts. But we as a country shouldn't have four, only four teams. You know, if you look at Italy, and this is, I don't want to be controversial. I'm never controversial. But just quickly, uh, Italy's got four teams and, and, and they they soccer nation. You know, France got which is also a big soccer nation. They got fourteen teams in the first division, full professional, fourteen teams in the second division, full professional, and fourteen teams, I think sixteen, semi professional in the third division, and fourteen in the in the fourth division. England's got a twelve teams in the first division and they've got twelve pro teams in the second division, then they go to amateur. So we as a country, I can't believe we can only have four teams. And it's yeah. pretty we couldn't get the team state in the Pro 16 as well. Now South Africa rugby tried. So there's a lot of ifs and buts. But I just feel very sad for the Cheetahs. They always produce great players. I mean, they, were, they beat the Bulls at the beginning of the year and then lost most of their players. And they still came close. So I really feel for them. But I, I'm a big believer that we need more teams. Uh, yeah. uh, um, because a lot of young players now is not going to have a place to play. And we've got mm. the best young players. And they're going to leave the country. So I hope we can get back to at least eight strong teams that can, that can play. And then just, I'm a big, big, big uh, guy for Super Rugby. I understand why we went north. But I truly hope and there is a chance that we're going to play in the Champions Cup later. Because the Pro 16 or Pro 14, with all due respect, is not a strong competition. Because the strongest clubs in the world is England and France. And, and they don't play in that competition. It's only right. Wales, uh, Ireland, which got one or two strong teams. And, and, uh, Italy and, and Scotland and, and Wales. So England and France don't play in that competition. So mm. if we move north and we can play in a Champions Cup where we can play against the likes of you know, the top English sides and the top French sides, then it's we a great to. move. We need to. If we're going to stay in the Pro 14, I would have preferred Super Rugby. I know there's financial reasons. Just out of a pure rugby point, I, li I like the Super Rugby because we play the best. But I've heard these rumors that after two or three years, uh, there's going to be a new deal, and then if we can play in the, in the, in the Championship Cup or the, uh, the Challenge mm -hmm. Cup, that would be great. That would be great because then you play against the best. No, absolutely, sure. Annika, lots of lots of knowledge and wisdom right there. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. A big honor speaking to you. I really enjoyed it. No, I really appreciate it, Annika. Well, Annika, you've been absolutely brilliant to chat to. You. Such great insights, brilliant rugby talk. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time. It's been really good. I must thank you. It's a deep honor. And uh, if I can end off, you know, it's uh, we South Africans, let's go out there and fight one more round. You know, if we stick together, we can beat anything in the world. Absolutely. One